The first day we ever sat down in my warehouse to film VinWiki car stories, the coolest guy that showed up was that dude in blue. I've known David since before he relocated to the Atlanta area, but he's always been a great friend and a huge supporter of VinWiki, so I can't thank him enough. And today, I've compiled the top 10 car stories that he's told for the channel. But before we roll into those, I have to thank Auto Tempest. They're our sponsor on VinWiki for this month. They're also the supporter of Car Trek, and Car Trek 6 is gonna release very, very soon on Freddy Tavares' channel. So be sure to check that out, but also go over right now in another tab while you listen to David tell some stories and search for your next car on Auto Tempest. Like, seriously, please click over right now because it really does help make VinWiki and Car Trek possible. They compile all the major listing sites into one search. Their motto, all the cars, one search, couldn't be any more accurate. It's where I start most of my mornings looking for my next car, which becomes my next adventure. So be sure to check them out to thank them for their support of VinWiki and have a great day. He could take me away, he could take my license away, my career could go away because I need to drive cars in order to sustain my career. So out of all of the years of being an automotive journalist, I guess you could call me there's one day in particular where I thought my career might end in literally 10 minutes. And that was, I was doing Adventure Drive with Rob Freddy, Matt Fair from The Smoking Tire. We were gonna go on vacation for once because YouTubers pretty much don't go on vacation. You pretty much have to make sure you have uploads ready to go while you're gone and you're just grinding away to buy this time to enjoy life at all, which, might sound ridiculous and overly sympathetic, but that's just how the job is. You just always have to be on top of it. So I go to Washington in Seattle and I'm completely ready for this vacation to get away from everything. Basically we're driving from Seattle, Washington all the way to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, but we're taking the scenic route, going through Montana, Glacier National Park, all these absolutely underrated places in the United States that you have to visit. You will appreciate it so much more here if you go visit these places. So I'm ready to go. I have been to Glacier before. That's what I was looking forward to. And I was like, let's get it. The great thing about it was that I had a press car from Toyota. So all I had to do was basically go on an extensive review of the Supra. And thankfully I had reviewed the Supra before. I was familiar with it, but it's more like a first impression. I had about an hour in the car and you really dig deep into a car once you drive it a long time. That's when those little nitpicky things start coming along going, okay, now I don't really think I would buy this. You know, you just start really noticing these things. We get in the Supra, we leave Seattle, everything is going perfectly fine. But in the convoy, people start driving faster than I'm comfortable with in an area I'm unfamiliar with, right? We're just outside of Seattle. We're driving, we're driving. Finally, the group is just gone. I'm just like, you know what? I'm gonna drive like a Boy Scout at least till we get out, out, out in the country. Finally, we get into the country and my GPS in the car goes out and doesn't wanna work. And then my phone GPS doesn't work. So I have no idea where I'm going. So I go, okay. I'm gonna have to catch the group. I really don't want to, but I'm just, you know what? I'm just gonna accelerate. I'm just gonna accelerate and then let off when I think I see them in the distance. I'm in the left lane and then there's this RV just kind of all over the place. It was swerving back and forth. It made me feel uncomfortable. I was like, he's either really tired or doing that other thing you're not supposed to be doing while you're driving. So I go, you know what? I'm just gonna go around him and then just go in the right lane right after I do my pull. And the Supra from like 60 to about 100 is actually pretty quick. It's a really good mid-range car. Past that, it starts doing this. It starts darting and getting a little swirly because it's a tiny little car and the wind throws it around. But basically rolling at 60, driving like a Boy Scout, nail the gas for probably five seconds. And as I'm passing the RV and going around a bend, cop. Out of the entire time I've been driving this morning, I didn't see a single cop and I was driving like a civilized human. Like aside from my car reviews, I drive pretty normal. Like on a daily basis, I drive pretty normal and people call me slow pokes on road trips and I don't care. 
because I don't want to sacrifice my record for my career. And that will come into play later in this story. So he sees me. I'm like, I am so toast. But I see the group up ahead. And I naively think, well, maybe they'll block for me. <laughs> so I go up and I'm like flashing my lights. I'm like trying, like yelling's going to do anything. Like move, like please move. And then my WhatsApp is blowing up on my phone. They're like, hey, a cop's coming. And I'm like, yeah, I know. I see him. And I get off at the next exit. And I'm like, he's totally going to find me. <laughs> so I turn off the next exit. And like, lo and behold, like I turn in. I'm like, here he comes. I did, I'm like counting. And I still don't see him. And then right when I start to have hope, there are the lights. I'm like, there he is. So I just gave up. I was like, yep, pulled over. He gets out of the car. I'm like, he is going to chew me a new one, right? And he comes in and he goes, what's the hurry? <laughs> I go, oh, you know, I got separated from my friends, which is not what you say. You should have said, oh, you know, I saw some cool cars and got a little too excited or something along those lines. Instead, I was like, yeah, I got separated and I shouldn't have done that, basically. Because at this point, my brain's on fire. I'm like, let's see here. He could take me away. He could take my license away. My career could go away because I need to drive cars in order to sustain my career. So he returns to the car after just being like, okay. And I couldn't tell if that was a good or a bad thing. So he comes back and then another cop pulls up and we sit there for a good 35 minutes. And me and uh, my fiance, Alejandra, I'm telling her like, listen, I might go to jail, but don't worry. We're going to figure it out. You're just going to have to drive the car. Okay, great. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there like twiddling my thumbs at this point. And it's funny where if you're in this situation, you're almost like, you know, if you're going to take me to jail, can we just, can we get this going? So I already know. So I can start preparing to get out of jail, right? It's like, got to get my phone call. Got to get all that done. But the thing is, they're just sitting there and they're laughing. I look in the rear view mirror and they're laughing at each other. And I'm like, that's either a really good thing or a really bad thing. And I personally think they were discussing what to do with me because I was out of state. That's more pain, you know, and basically came back up and said, here's your court date. Here's your ticket. It's a reckless driving. And I grew up in Virginia where reckless ends your life, right? <laughs> basically it ruins your life for at least a year or two because they're so strict there but I'm in Washington. So I don't really connect the dots that it might not be as bad, right? As Virginia, or at least to fight it. He lets me go and I don't even want to drive anymore. I'm just kind of over it. I pull into a gas station, go to the bathroom, come back out on my, 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 on my day one of my vacation, you know, day one. If it was on day six, I'd be like, that would have sucked, you know? But Alejandro starts driving the Supra, and we're just driving and it's like dead silent in the car. You know, we're just driving along and I'm just like, I want to talk about it. I want to talk about it. And as this is happening, I'm looking up reckless driving laws in Washington. I'm just overthinking. I'm way too overthinking this. And we go to, I think it's called Cannon Beach where the Goonies was filmed in Oregon. And it's this beautiful beach. And I'm just grumpy. You know, I was like, Arr. and Matt Fair is like, don't worry about it, bro. Like, go get off the record and blah, blah, blah. This is not a sponsor plug, but he convinces me to use off the record. And I'm like, a phone app? Come on. Like, really? I don't know. And he goes, it gets you a lawyer. You need a lawyer and it'll help you. I promise. Went back to the hotel, took a picture of the ticket, put it on off the record. And they found me a lawyer in like an hour. And then what's so funny, my lawyer, who was an absolute rock star, asked me, this giant list of questions like, were you drinking? Were you doing this? Were you in a crash? Like, I don't want to take this case basically if you did any of these things. And I just said, I was going too fast. So he calls me and goes, all right, so how'd you get a reckless driving? I don't really quite understand. I'm like, cause I was going 104 miles an hour. And he goes, yeah, but people do that in Seattle every day. That was his kind of reaction to it. And I was like, okay, so what should I do? And he goes, don't worry, I'm going to figure it out. And the only problem is you got pulled over in probably the most strict county in all of Washington state, or at least around Seattle. So they're might going to try and make an example out of you. I'm like, awesome. This is just delicious. I love this. So meanwhile, on day three of my trip, I'm driving, I'm driving, and I'm like, I'm going to be an example. <laughs> you just, I'm just like, why am I driving? Should I even be driving? And in Washington state in particular, I really didn't like driving. I just, I already had the heebie-jeebies. 
But Matt Farah is like, you're overreacting. You know, <laughs> he's right. He's like, occupational hazard. Don't worry about it. You know, finally by day six or seven of the trip, I've definitely loosened up a little bit, but it's still in the back of my head. And when I go home, I gotta have this taken care of. I get home, I have a subpoena in the mail saying I have to physically show up in court in Atlanta, Georgia and fly all the way back to Washington. And so I call my lawyer and I'm like, help, like, help me out. Here's my situation. What should I do? And he goes, yeah, I would start getting ready. I would start getting ready to come out, but don't get your plane ticket just yet. So I go, oh my God, this is ridiculous, right? I was going too fast. Like, can we just work this out, please? I didn't hit anybody. I didn't cause a ruckus, like, please. And I was the tamest one of the bunch. I know for a fact that if I didn't go off that exit ramp, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have been pulled over or selected to be pulled over. I'm pretty sure everybody would have pulled over, but I made the dumb decision to go off the exit ramp, right? So eventually the lawyer found a different prosecutor for me and was like, she's way cooler. <laughs> like she's way more easy to negotiate with. I think we're gonna be okay. And finally I get the email saying, you don't have to come to Washington. I'm gonna try and take care of this for you. And here's what we're gonna do. And basically he negotiated a deal of negligent driving, which means it's not a misdemeanor anymore, which is really what gets you, is once you hit that misdemeanor, you're in trouble. It was like a $5,000 fine, losing your license for a while. That was all on the table. But now all of that was off the table. And knowing that George and Washington don't really talk that much when it comes to this stuff, I was like, oh, thank goodness, right? So finally he goes, take the deal and run. It was a $500 fine and it was negligent driving, which is basically just a gnarly normal traffic ticket. I did it, signed the papers, and I was all done. But without Farrah's recommendation, I would have been 10 times worse off because I wouldn't have known where to go. Like you're in a city 3000 miles away. You don't know any lawyers in town. You don't know who to trust. But thankfully, like without the record and everything, it took care of me and that's why I recommend it to everyone. And that's not just me saying it because of a sponsorship, that's me saying it because it's such an amazing service and it could help so many people. So at the end of the day, don't speed kids, but at the same time, everybody makes mistakes and you're gonna be just fine. If don't overreact, life gets hard sometimes and it's gonna suck if you do get in trouble but it's gonna pass, time's gonna pass, and you're gonna feel better. And don't let a ticket or a gnarly pullover ruin the rest of your vacation. So it's about the same as an SX. Yeah, oh yeah, you're right, oh no. We're gonna go on adventure drive with Rob Freddy and super speeders and all those good people. We're gonna start in Denver and end up in California, Napa Valley. I had only rode shotgun every other adventure drive other than the last Europe one where everybody got pulled over in Switzerland and all that good stuff. But I was like, no, I don't care if it's an exotic or not. I'm gonna have something to drive. And I'm like, you know what? Basic Mustang GT, somebody's gotta have it. Super simple, no big deal. Well, Enterprise and Hertz want like two to $3,000 for a one way of a Mustang. And I'm like, you know what? More power to them. I'm sure they have their reasons. They don't want to ship it back, whatever, fine. Well, then I find that Budget has this deal out of St. Louis to do a one way Mustang GT with a Coyote 5.0 in it. I'm like, okay, that's solid. 450 ish horsepower. It can keep up with everybody. It's fine. They go, only St. Louis does one way at this price point that you want, $800 compared to the two to 3,000. Like that's a bargain in between, you know, for almost two weeks of driving, it adds up, that's fine. So I'm like, okay, so if I fly into St. Louis and just champ through driving Missouri and Kansas, which is everyone's favorite state to drive through, It'll be fine. We'll just make it there to Denver. We'll just drive two extra states because we're already driving 3,000 miles, whatever. Fly into St. Louis. We have this grand plan. Everything's gonna go perfect. We asked them six times that it was the V8 model. Six 
times to make sure that before I buy a plane ticket to the wrong city, that it's gonna be the right car. They pull up and they go, here you go. And it's a V6 Camaro. And I'm like, oh my God, no way. And I feel like I'm gonna be a pretentious brat by complaining, right? You know, we fly in, we're just another customer. I hate to be this guy, but I go, hi, excuse me, as polite as I can. Hi, excuse me, we actually ordered the V8 model, blah, blah, blah. And they go, oh, sir, we don't even have those cars here at this station. I'm like, so what about down the street? They go, no, there's no Mustang GTs for rental in this entire area. I'm like, so you're telling me I can't like Uber somewhere else and go pick it up with this reservation. They go, oh, well, you, it says that the person on your phone reservation put you under the wrong class. So they didn't deliver the car to the rental place. So I look at my girlfriend, I look at her, the person behind the counter is almost in tears because she felt like she screwed up. But at the same time, most people who work at rental places aren't car people. So they don't know the difference. She's like, but you have this nice Camaro and blah, blah, blah. And my brain's being like super analytical. Like, I'm not gonna be able to keep up. I'm not gonna be able to do this or that. And uh, the new Camaro is a little claustrophobic and blah, blah, after all that time in the car. I was like, all right, I'm gonna figure this out. Here's what we're gonna do. I have a plan. So I call Rob Ferretti up from Super Speeders and I go, so listen. And Rob goes, you didn't get the rental, did you? I, di I didn't even have to tell him the story. He goes, it's okay. I have something for you because I'm out in Denver buying a Ferrari right now. So he went out there, bought a 360 Spider. He had a Acura NSX that he was gonna use as a backup plan, which ended up being a backup plan for me. So. I tell the lady at the budget counter, listen, it's not your fault. You have no idea anything about cars. That's fine. I will take the V6 Camaro, but can I drop it off in Denver? They go, yes, but we still have to charge you X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, oh, okay. So they still charge me. And then I ended up calling them later and getting my money back. But drove the Camaro from St. Louis all the way to Denver, drove through Missouri, through Kansas, got there and basically ended up using this Camaro as an errand boy car. Cause we're like, hey, we still got it for a day. So we ended up getting some of the cars delivered for the Adventure Drive customers with it and all kinds of stuff. So it kind of worked out that we had this rental car, then went back to the airport, delivered it, then hopped in the NSX and started Adventure Drive. It ended up all working out because during Adventure Drive, I got to experience an NSX for days and days and days and give a really good opinion about it, what it's like to really road trip in a car like this. And I could kind of compare it to the new one and everything else. So I'm driving along and I ended up switching keys with everybody. I ended up switching keys with a 458 Ferrari, which I ended up in the middle of nowhere, Nevada, racing Adam LZ and his GT350 and found out that his bolt-on GT350 could pull on a 458 Italia, which was wild. So we are out in the middle of the desert just goofing around and I'm like, this would have never happened in a V6 Camaro. So ironically, even after not liking the Camaro for having the limited amount of horsepower, I got another car that had a limited amount of horsepower, but it didn't even matter because the NSX was just that much more fun. It showed that you could have a decently slow car on the trip and you'd be fine. But the thing was, you just had to have way more cojones to do it. I, to keep up with Shavam from Super Speeders in the middle of the desert, he was in his GT3 RS and I'm in the NSX and the whole car is vibrating and shaking and like the wind you get because the target top had a leak in it. So the wind's coming in. So I'm going like 150 miles an hour somewhere in the desert. Just mm, and you know, Shavam's just hanging out. You know, why you have other people in Audi RS7s and stuff like that. It's just like a piece of cake. A lot of people don't really have a good analogy for it, but I kind of say it's a Miata on steroids in a way. It's a little bit faster than a Miata. It revs higher. It has this beautiful sound to it. Very unique to that car. Like no other car sounds like that V6 and that NSX. And so revving it out is enjoyable and hitting VTEC and all that. So you're just beating the snot out of this car to keep up with everybody else. But that's what's so fun about it. 
And if you've never been in one either, you'll realize it's one of the most comfortable supercars there ever was. It's very roomy, the visibility's good. Neither my girlfriend or I were ever tired really driving it. And compared to say driving a Huracan across the country, that would beat you up after a while. The NSX just doesn't beat you up. It's very simple, the long gearing, it gets great gas mileage, which is funny because everybody else is filling up every five seconds. We had a Murcielago on the trip and he just could not make it half the time. We just stop and stop and stop. I'd be filling up, oh, I'm still at three fourths of the tank. That car, I get why its value is still so high. There was a point where it kept dropping and coming back up, but it was a Corvette competitor, it was a Ferrari competitor, and it feels just as good as those cars in the same era, if not better, because it feels like a quality car. And that's why people like Rob Ferretti have held on to an NSX that has over 100,000 miles on it. That blue one I drove had over 100,000 miles on it. And did it creak and rattle? You bet. But it didn't matter because it was just that fun to drive. Even though if you have a bad experience with a real car company, first, just don't go back to them. And two, there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. You'll figure something out. The nitrous bottle got loose. It started spraying everywhere. One of my best friends in the car world, his name is Christopher. And Christopher has been there for me since day one, probably since like 2015. He was the one who found my 240SX project car. He towed it back home to Virginia with me. We have a really close relationship. The guy's just a good dude. There's just no way around it. So he also had this 990 wheel horsepower Mitsubishi Evo that was absolutely ridiculous. It was so scary. And it was like driving on ice. If you didn't have drag radials on it, it was like crab walking all over the road like this when you get on it. So amazing. We had a great time. We drove it in downtown Atlanta with a parachute on the back, you know, cause it was just obnoxious drag car. Everything's great. A few months later, Chris gets sick. So Chris gets very sick and has kidney failure. And I think obviously this is terrible. He has to go to dialysis three times a week and his life is looking pretty grim. And so everybody's trying to do their part. So fast forward to about two years later, he's pretty much broke and he needs to live somewhere. So we ended up taking in Chris and he ended up selling the Evo for you know all kinds of reasons, you know as you can imagine. And he ended up getting this Pontiac G8 but before that, he had a Taurus SHO and he had a BMW 535i. So he's starting to get into the big four-door stuff. So he wanted something fast that was comfortable naturally because he was driving to dialysis all the time and medical stuff all the time. So he's just like, I need something just comfortable. So he has the 335i. He had a 2JZ IS300 with a big turbo on it. So really cool cars. Ends up getting this Pontiac G8 down in Florida that had nitrous on it, had a big cam in it, and it was like a 10 second car basically. And a uh, big old nitrous bottle in the back trunk. And he ends up showing it to, he just pulls into my driveway when he was living with me and this year, blow, 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 blow. I'm like, what sounds like they're about to throw up outside. You know, I go outside and the whole car's shaking. I'm like, Chris, what did you do? And he goes, oh, I bought it. I'm like, you bought it? And he goes, yeah, I just thought it was cool. So that was his new daily. I was like, this is your daily? He goes, I mean, I don't really got a choice right now and I wanted something cool. And I'm like, you know what? You treated yourself. That's just fine. So one day Chris says, hey David, you should do a video on the G8. And I was like, yeah, I've done a video on a G8 before, but that was like four years ago. So you know what? This would be interesting. Yours is nitrous and everything. He goes, only problem is I have so many doctor's appointments. So if I'm not home and the car is home, you can take it whenever you want. Big mistake. So I actually get a call from History Channel out of all places. And they go, hey, listen, we're trying to promote the new season of Vikings, you know, huge TV show on there. And I'm like, why are you hitting me up? You know, like Vikings? They're like, well, we're trying to find people who are creative and doing really funny Instagram posts with a big giant Viking like bullhorn. So like they send me in the mail this like actual prop from the show that they've used before. And uh, it's just this big Viking bullhorn, you know, like obnoxious call horn. 
And I'm like, how am I gonna, how am I gonna do this? Like, it's a paid gig, it's good, I gotta do it. Obviously, it's History Channel. This might lead to greater things in the future. You can't say no to History Channel. And I'm just thinking, I say, okay, I'll do it. And I tell my girlfriend, okay, listen, you're gonna get this really weird thing in the mail. You're not gonna know what it is, but it's a Viking horn. She goes, why are we getting a Viking horn? And I just jokingly, I'm like, oh, I got it off Amazon for a deal or whatever. She says, why do you need that? I'm like, I don't. <laughs> so we get it in the mail, post office loses it. And I drive to three different post offices and they all say they don't have it. Go back to the first one. They said, oh, we had it all along. It was in the back. Uh, so I'd like to thank the United States Post Office for that stressful situation because the Instagram picture was due that day. So I needed to get the prop and get the post up by 10 at night. So they also wanted a video plugging it as well. So I'm freaking out. I don't know what to do and I cannot lose this gig. So I go outside and I'm just kind of pacing back and forth. I'm looking at my Mustang, I'm looking at my 240. I'm looking and I go, wait a minute. And there's the G8 sitting right there. One of my buddies, Tanner is over and I look at Tanner and I go, you think that Chris is gonna care if we, do you have the G8 keys? He goes, I got the G8 keys. I'm like, okay, bad move, Chris. So end up taking the G8 keys. I never driven it before period like i'd never been in it get in the car and i go okay tanner now hondra and my girlfriend this is what we're gonna do tanner you're gonna hang out of the window it's like you're doing a freaking mating call for vikings with the horn and i'm gonna do a massive burnout so we hunt and hunt and hunt for about two hours looking for a place to do a burnout without getting in trouble so we end up like more North Georgia, you know, there's not as much going on. I look around, like, okay, take one. And I just go for it, you know, brake stand, bam, and everything's going fine, and then the traction control kicks in. So it goes, Ugh, uh, you know, nothing happens. I'm like, uh-oh. And there's somebody, I didn't know, there was a house way back in the woods. And this guy comes out and goes, what the hell is going on out there? And we're like, oh, we gotta go. So get in the car, nail it drive away, leave two giant black lines, keep going. They end up turning around somewhere else. Like, okay, this is our last chance. We gotta get this stupid picture. The picture was more important than the video. So we're like, we gotta get this picture. So we do a burnout. It's really, it's a solid burnout. Nothing compared to like an Australian glorious burnout, but it's a burnout for a picture. Take the picture, Tanner's hanging out the side, almost falls out, almost drops the prop. Like we're just trying to make it work because I tried to make it a rolling burnout. So brake stand then kind of go away and make a big old cloud. Alejandra is running back to the car. Like we gotta get out of here, we gotta get out of here. What I didn't realize is that earlier in the day, one of the accelerations in the Pontiac G8 though had unmounted the nitrous bottle. So the nitrous bottle got loose and started spraying everywhere. So this cold nitrous is just going everywhere. Tanner's trying to get it back in place. And it's, you know, obviously his hands are getting hit by this nitrous and it, that's not good, obviously. So by the time he got everything settled in, his hands were almost not even functioning. You know, they were just like so cold and everything. Got it back in place. We just unbolted the whole thing. We're like, no, just no nitrous for this event. Fast forward to later when I'm asking Tanner to hold the horn and hold everything else or hold a camera, you know, he's like, trying to because nitrous hit this poor guy's hands so everything happens everything goes well get back to the house and chris comes back from dialysis we ended up walking in to the garage and like see anything different about your g8 and he goes why are my tires looking like they're so much more worn out i'm like well you did say i could do whatever i wanted and so i ended up showing him the clip i was like kind of worried he would be a little mad but no he just laughed it off and was like, that's awesome. Still has it. And now it's being big turbo built in Florida at the moment. And Chris finally got better, found a living donor that had only met him once ever. And was like, yeah, I'll save your life and gave his kidney to him. So he's now doing much better. So everything kind of came full circle. So he gets to do more burnouts and he gets to still live without dialysis or anything. So. 
life is good. George finds this car that was in somebody's backyard for $180. So I would say one of the biggest motorsports that has really taken off in the past 10 years is drifting. Uh, drifting is a grassroots motorsport nowadays and tons of people want to get into it because they think it's cheap. The thing about drifting is that you go through tires, you go through control arms, you go through parts a lot. And to find a budget drift car, you know, that's a lot of work. It's a lot of time, a lot of effort. And to find a platform that suits you and you like at the same time is pretty tough, especially if you're not scared to damage it because it's going to happen when you drift as soon as you learn how to tandem and things of that nature with other people you're gonna hit doors you're gonna hit fenders so you kind of need to find something that you kind of sort of care about and thankfully one of my buddies george uh from gmg automotive he's been out here before with a whole bunch of stories but he hit me up and said hey david let's build a drift car in a week for a thousand dollars and to me, I was like, is that even possible? It, can that even be done? You know, especially if you want to have an angle kit to be able to turn the wheels more and control arms and seats, you know, putting a bucket seat really helps with drifting because it keeps you in place. It's not as fast as time attack. That's what a lot of people don't realize is that drifting is more smooth than people think because it's at a slower speed, but it's a little bit more intense. But with drifting, you want a car that's gonna run, it's not gonna break, and it's affordable if it breaks. So George finds this car that was in somebody's backyard for $180 running and driving. It's an E36 for $180, and the E36 is becoming a huge drift platform right now because the 240s were kind of getting overpriced now and that car is kind of starting to run its course now people are starting to go to the 350zs but the thing is about the e36 is that there's parts everywhere for them and the cool thing is that inline six if you find a good one it's really bulletproof so we find this it has 300 000 miles on it everything is it's rough i mean it has cigarette stains the the head liner is drooping down it smells like it smells awful i'm just like i gotta clean this thing up so we finally come up with a plan to do the a thousand dollar build the thing is is that we wanted to make it to fellow youtuber adam lz's open house in florida so this is in december we're trying to make it there with the car because he has a private track day just for us so we get the car it's green it's worn out paint it's ugly so the first thing we do is find smaller wheels. So we get smaller wheels for almost nothing. We get used tires for almost nothing. And that was one of the bi biggest expenses, which is funny. But we end up finding out that you can do an angle kit for an E36 for around $60. And the way you do it is you get this bracket off eBay. It's just kind of this billet aluminum bracket. And what you do is you take E46 control arms and you just relocate it. So you take that bracket and you put it in a different spot. You put the longer E46 control arms, you have an angle kit in a nutshell. So now we have more angle. We're still not even to like $150 yet. And we're already saying, wow, we could actually use this right now if we really wanted to. But we wanted it to be a fun car to drive and not miserable. The car didn't even have seats in it. It had a wheel for a seat at the time, that was it. So we went online, we got eBay bucket seats, which I don't recommend, but for our purpose of our build, that's what we did. We got eBay bucket seats. We got a steering wheel sponsored. So that was like another thing off the list. And then we got a hub from eBay as well. So we got that on there. That was 50 to to $100. And then I went in with uh, my car care product, which is Patterson Car Care, went in there, cleaned everything, cleaned the carpet, cleaned the seats, did all these things to make it more tolerable. We got almost everything out of the carpet and the headliner, which is amazing. We have the car pretty much buttoned up. After about four days of working really hard, really late nights, we're still almost to Adam Elsie's open house, which we need to trailer the car all the way down to Florida. So we're like, are we going to make it? Are we going to get this car there? And so we end up staying up till about three or four in the morning to get this car ready. The car's still ugly and it's driving me nuts. And I was like, you know what we could do? 
we could plasti dip it just as a budget clean solution just for now so i call up my buddy fonzie from dip your car we get blue dude plasti dip which is named after my youtube channel we get that we come in and we were gonna do it somewhere else with a paint booth but then they couldn't do it but we only have 12 hours to plasti dip this and get to florida so i go to home depot i get some fans i get some tarps i do as basically like a dexter style room <laughs> with saran wrap you know as close as i could get it to a paint booth we open all the windows in the house we do everything we can so we end up using the dip your car uh paint gun set up and all that we mix it, we get it in there, and I just start going. You know, we prime it this kind of with the Nardo gray kind of looking primer. We look at it and we go, do we want to keep going? I mean, it looks kind of nice gray, but we're like, no, we're committed. We said we were going to do it this way. So we wait for it to dry. We do our five coats of the primer, then we do the five coats of the blue, but it was excruciating. I'm talking like, you know, just the, the vapor just rising up. And my poor girlfriend was in the room above it and she could just smell it coming up. And I was just like, this is ridiculous. Why did we even do this? Nobody would have cared if it was the ugly paint job, you know, but we were dedicated. The only caveat to all this is that it was raining outside too. So we lift up the garage door. Now there's moisture getting inside. So there's moisture getting under the Plasti Dip. So we needed to figure out a way to get rid of that. So we ended up having to restart. So we restarted with one of the panels, redid it, and it looked fine. But, you know, I was a perfectionist that night. I was like, no, I'm going to fix it again. Meanwhile, six hours go by, you know, seven hours go by. And we're still in this basement. You know, we're still going at it. Finally, we managed to get it all buttoned up and it looks decent. It could look better, but for a, you know, really quick dip job, it looks pretty good. It looks way better than it did before. The next morning, we get everything ready. We button up the car. We get an alignment on the car that morning for, you know, drift alignment. We put it on the trailer and we head down to Florida. We get to Orlando Speed World. We're super stoked. We have no idea how the car is going to drive. We did donuts in our parking lot. That's all we did with no alignment. So we get out there and we're like, was this all worth it? And we did the tally of how much money we spent. We ended up spending, I think it was $1,100 for the whole thing. And we, our goal was 1000 but 1100 it's hard to complain about when you have a ready-to-go race car. You know, and... You know, it made probably like 200 to the wheel or whatever, but it was enough to drift because we welded the diff. You know, we tore that apart. We welded that and put it all together and it did perfect figure eights. It did perfect donuts. It did perfect angle around the track at OSW, which is this perfect skid pad. And it was my first time drifting ever. And I was able to, it wasn't pretty, but I was able to kind of learn and by the end of that day, I could do a full figure eight across the whole skid pad and I could do a full drift around the long bend. And I was satisfied. I was like, wow, we have this car for a thousand dollars. And there's an argument going around nowadays in the drift community that everybody overbuilds their drift car as in they have to have, you know, 500 horsepower. They have to have the, the best, the best, everything. The real thing is if you're innovative, if you set a budget where you have like, the show must go on no matter what you do your research. It's possible, especially with the BMW platforms because of how well that chassis was balanced out of the factory, even with 300,000 miles on it, it's still ripped. We did two more track events after that. And the only thing that happened was the heater core went out, heater core hose, excuse me. And that was it, we fixed that right on the spot, just took off the intake manifold put the new one on and it ran like a champ and it never broke again. So it's pretty amazing what you can do with a little money if you use your imagination and you do your research and then you can be a part of another awesome car community. It's great. But you go up there and you're like, I'm gonna go street racing, but not getting in trouble. So sometimes in life, 
you get emails that look like spam, but you just take a chance anyway. So back in 2017, I received an email from Quebec in Canada, and it was an email saying, hey, we're doing something called the Paul Walker Memorial Ride. We'd love for you to come up. We'll even like pay for your stay and everything. And I was like, I don't know. And I'm kind of feeling this person out over email. His name's Kevin. And Kevin finally goes, listen, here's like photos of everything. We've done the ride before. It's going to be great. And Chad Lindbergh is going to be there. The guy who played Jesse in Fast and Furious. And I've always kind of joked about Jesse, how he just got robbed in the first movie. You know, he was just off in the first movie. And the first Fast and Furious was low budget for the most part. And they didn't think they were going to make any sequels. So in that contained story, Jesse was a casualty. And later on in the franchise, he never came back. But it'd still be a cool opportunity to meet the guy who played Jesse. Why not? I end up giving into it and go, you know what? I'll come to Quebec, Canada. I've never been there. I don't speak French or French Canadian, but let's see how it goes. I get to the airport and I land in a propeller plane <laughs> to connect, get off the plane and meet Nick and Kevin. They are basically, I guess you could say the people taking care of me. They are kind of like my tour guides, but also I ended up becoming very, very good friends with them because they're very nice, humble people. And I was very comfortable there already. This went from a spammy kind of feeling email to, okay, I think I did the right thing. So we go around Quebec City first, and if you haven't been to Quebec City, it's probably the most underrated city on the East Coast of North America. It is like Hogwarts. You know, it looks like Diagon Alley, and people are speaking French, and you're like, did I cross the pond? Like, it feels like you left America. We end up driving around town, and they threw me the keys to Nick's STI. He had an STI and he also had a Nismo GTR. And so we go driving the back roads of Quebec and as you can imagine, the roads are awful. I mean, they're curvy and beautiful, but the pavement is like the worst I've ever seen. So you're bumpy and going, trying to avoid everything. So we, had, we also had a turbo FRS on this driving day where the coilover completely snapped off the top hat and we had to limp the car all the way back from the mountains and we finally got back. So. I basically got a taste of what people had to deal with in the car culture up there of the rough environment and the very short time window of fun you get in sports cars because it's just rough the rest of the year. We end up leaving Quebec City and go to Montreal. Go to Montreal and that's where we see the Jetta replica being built by a good buddy named Dom. Dom in the shop out in Montreal set out to basically go one-for-one one replica of the Jetta from the movie. We're talking, they got basically the vinyl decals from the same guy who did it in the movie. So I'm very impressed. They're finishing it up. It's not even done yet. And finally, Chad Lindbergh shows up and just loses his mind. Like, he's just absolutely flabbergasted what this team of people have done, you know, with this VR6 Jetta that they've done. It was so interesting meeting Chad because you totally get why they cast him. But he showed up with black nail polish and like dressed up as Jesse. He was just so into it and so grateful for what these people did just to basically make him happy. And the next day we went to the Paul Walker Memorial ride and we raced it against an S2000. Basically like a rematch between Johnny Tran and and the Jetta, and it was probably the slowest drag race you could possibly imagine watching, but it was really fun to watch, and everybody yelling and screaming. And the Quebec car scene at the Paul Walker Memorial Ride really embraces this early 2000 vibe, because they're blasting like ludicrous in the background, and they have all the, the soundtrack from all the movies playing, but the cool thing about this racetrack was that it was closing down, so they did not care about anything you did. It was basically street racing, but legally. Like you went on there, you could roll race, you could drag race. And Nick threw me the keys to the Nismo GTR and I just beat everybody. <laughs> like it was just one after another. We ended up making it a challenge to see who could beat the Nismo GTR. And one other Skyline that was like an R32 got pretty close, but he just spun off the line so bad he couldn't keep up. But you know, R35 does all the work for you when you go off the line. So it was fun and then Eventually, the hospitality of 
everybody in Quebec was so nice in Montreal that viewers of my channel were just throwing me the keys to every car you could imagine. They're like, race mine, race mine, race mine. And the next thing you know, I'm driving a boosted V6 Mustang, which you n almost never see. I raced that against a whole bunch of people. I couldn't believe what was happening because in America, you don't have racetracks without regulations. Like that's not a thing. But you go up there and you're like, I'm gonna go street racing, but not get in trouble. And unfortunately the racetrack did end up closing down because it was rough. I mean, you'd go on the bleachers and you'd be like, I really hope this doesn't fall apart because there's rust and it creaked and you sat down and you're getting splinters on your butt. Like it was just not a good time. But the next year I went back. I never thought I would go back to go back at the beginning of the trip. I thought, you know, this probably be a one-time thing and it'll be great. But then I ended up going back and doing the same thing all over again and realizing how good of people they were there. And Quebec gets kind of a bad rep in Canada because the regulations are more strict there than it is, say, in Ontario or something like that. So when you go there, a lot of the cars are not that great. <laughs> you know, you kind of have to give people the benefit of their situation because they're so into cars that they'll take any commuter car and just make it work. So you end up seeing these really absurd builds, like a Ford Probe with a body kit on it and a turbo on it. And then you see all these cars you just wouldn't imagine being modified, but they somehow made it work. And also you'll see ricers there, but you have like this feeling like you shouldn't like them, but you do like them because you know the amount of time and effort they put into them to make it look like that. And you're like, well, it's just part of their culture, whatever. I saw a Mercury Cougar there, like a not the cool one. I mean, the really awful one. And that had a body kit on it. Like nobody would do that in the United States. Absolutely nobody. But people would go up to him and be like, oh, nice, nice. <laughs> I'm like, are you sure? Are you sure that it's nice? But eventually, everybody I met there was incredibly kind, and Quebec has a rep of them being mean. So it was interesting to see this come completely opposite view. But at the same time, I was dealing with car people. And if you go anywhere in the world and you have the common love of cars, including Chad Lindbergh, it just shows how easy it is to talk to people. And at the end of the day, I ended up giving Chad Lindbergh a ride in the Nismo GTR. He'd never been in one, and he just lost it. Let's do it. Three, two, one, go! Woo! <laughs> yes! Woo! He had never gone that fast before, which is very ironic for a Fast and Furious star. He's supposed to be this hardcore racer, but he had never gone that fast on a drag strip, ever. So it was an interesting dynamic scene, the reaction of Chad, the hospitality of people in Quebec, how much they begged for me to come back the next year. It was just very humbling and very flattering in a lot of ways that this tiny, tiny little car community impacted me so much. And I definitely wanna give a shout out to everybody who was involved with the Paul Walker Memorial Ride because it was awesome. Rob, will you do the honors? Certainly. <laughs> Almost every single year, I do something that's almost a tradition, and that is Mustang Week. Mustang Week is this overly obnoxious, crazy car meet from the outside, but the actual event is really calm, collected, not much goes on. It's just this beautiful car show of all these things people have done to Mustangs. And as you can imagine, with so many owners over the decades and decades and decades of these cars, you see crazy engine swaps, crazy suspension setups, crazy wraps, paint jobs, what have you. And that's what keeps you coming back because you're gonna be like, I wonder what that weird guy I met last year is gonna do. I met a guy who had an 80s Fox body and he put a brand new Coyote in it and whole nine yards, fully restored it. And what was interesting about it was that it was an SVO. So it was originally four cylinder and he had a he had a crazy dash system and everything. I was like, wow, this is worth coming to every year. This is back in like 2013, my first time all by myself. Well, 
that's before I knew of the night meets and everything else. So Mustang Week used to be at the mall off Kings Highway in Myrtle Beach. And it got too big for its own good and it was too hot. It's just black top with no shade and in the middle of July. So it's just awful. I would come out with like the worst sunburn in the world. So I'd like, if I wore a tank top, it'd be all burnt here, all burnt here. And I got that terrible bro tan going. So they decided after years and years and years of having it in July, they moved it. So they moved it to September instead, which was a risky move, you, right? Yeah, it's like, no, you just change up tradition and people can't really take off work as much in the fall. So I'm like, you know what? It's probably not gonna be that great, but I'll go anyway, sure, just for a day or two. Drive down there, five hour drive, get there. And I meet up with my friend, Rob Raybon. Rob Raybon, is a character who builds these amazing cars. He had the first ever basically airbagged Mustang and that became this huge trend now. You know, it's the Instagram thing to do now. And he was an expert with Plasti Dip and Autoflex. So every year he would change his car from rainbow to a more of a Mystachrome. Then he had a, like a fighter jet shark mouth on the side one year and he all did this with Plasti Dip and it looked like a wrap. So, by meeting Rob, that was an amazing experience because you never knew what he was going to bring out next. Well, this year, he just threw everybody off and brought out his Fox body. He bought this Fox body that's made for drifting, and it's all cambered out. It looks like rust. He, put, he purposely put rust on the car to make it look ratted out. And after that, it just got more and more eccentric. So he has these crazy, you know, air holes in the back for, you know, diffusion and it's not a single color anywhere. So he's a character, he's awesome. And I have my friend Leo who also had his car sprayed by Rob. It's a crazy rainbow color. On my channel, we call it the offensive Mustang because Rob Ferretti from Super Speeder said that car is so hideous it offends me. So that's why we called it that. So this year, new location too. Remember we were talking about the mall? Well, now we're at the convention center in Myrtle Beach. What could possibly go wrong? Got the convention center, nice, calm, collected, and it's big open spaces. Then on the outside for spectators is this giant wide open parking lot. And it all clears out, there's no one around, and I realize, wow, I haven't filmed a single thing today. I should probably get on that. And you know, that's what I do, that's what I'm there for. And I'm like, I kinda need, what, what's really good? What, what's the most important part of a video? your intro. Your intro is, in my opinion, your most important part because it engages your audience. So I look at Rob, who's next to me in his Fox body, and I'm in my car, and I go, hey Rob, you want to do some shenanigans? He goes, okay. So I pull up my camera, I look at it, I go, hey, welcome to Mustang Week 2017. And I look over at Rob and go, will you do the honors? And he goes, certainly. He goes up, does this gnarly donut. Like it's perfect. Like it's not just a donut where you're going full lock. It's a slide. Like it's this perfect slide around and Leo's laughing, I'm laughing because I didn't expect it to be like that. I thought it was going to be some smoke and be done. Well, Rob pulls around and you hear me and Leo freaking out going, wow, that was amazing. I can't wait to show everybody this. Right when I say that in my brain, an undercover Mustang pulls him over in the parking lot. He was out there waiting for people to do something stupid. So it had like underglow police lights. And so nothing on top, nothing in the windshields or anything. So Rob thinks it's just somebody screwing with him, right? It's like, there's no way that's a cop car. It's a gray 2015 Mustang. It looks stock. She so had no idea. Pulls him over. And there were some sensor bleeps going on in my video because we were just like, no way. You know, we were absolutely in shock. Leo, who had been pulled over last Mustang week, says they always do this routine. They always tell you they're going to impound your car and everything else, which has happened, but it didn't happen to Leo. So Leo's like, it'll be fine, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I don't know, man, that was a serious donut. Like that wasn't just a burnout. And Leo got fined last year and to the point where somebody paid for his ticket because he loved his burnout so much. So that's the kind of community you see at Mustang Week. And so Rob, you can see him just like all stiff and just like, yes, sir, no, sir. Like, I won't, I won't do it again. I'm sorry, blah, blah, blah. And lets him off scot-free. Um, 
with a ticket, but he was threatened with impound and jail time. So that is scot free, in my opinion. Pulls up, and I go, Rob, you know, for doing that, do you want me to pay for your ticket? I will absolutely do that for that shot. Like, I will pay for that shot, you know? And he was like, no, man, it was worth it. It was a great time. It's fine. And he just wouldn't let it go. I kept telling him, like, all day, every day. I was like, oh, come on, let me do it. And he's like, no. So Rob was really cool about that. We had a really, really interesting time with that. And it just created this different vibe around the entire Mustang week the rest of the weekend because you just don't know where they are anymore. Because used to at the mall, it was just like eight cops in front of the mall. And people would just be like, you know what? I can pay for a ticket. And they would just do something anyway. And that was the kind of vibe of it. But it was also famous for, you know, people hitting people by accident, same location. Um, so that's kind of toned down over the years. So what Rob did really wasn't that big of a deal. It wasn't around people and that's why the cop let him go. Ooh, I made it, I survived, that's awesome. Driving modified cars is always a huge risk. And when it's owner's cars, I've never really done a press car in my entire career, which I find is an achievement on its own. Uh, and at the same time, owner's cars have stories. And this one in particular was super intriguing because it was an 1,000 horsepower Evo. It was an Evo 10. It was in Virginia Beach, and the owner's name was Reese. And I've heard about this car, you know, down the grapevine. I heard from a little birdie, this car is really fast. And I always heard about it, but I didn't really initiate yet if I was gonna drive it or not, because I didn't know him, right? And finally, a few people are like, listen, you gotta come down to Virginia Beach. There's this great car, try it. Okay, who's this? They go, Reese is. I'm like, oh, okay. So I drive, you know, the two hours to get there from Richmond, Virginia, and meet him, super nice guy. Also meet his tuner. And they're like, okay, so the 1,000 horsepower tune isn't working today, but sadly, you can only drive the 825 horsepower tune. And I'm like, oh God, how tragic. So get in the car. I'm super ready. I've done Evos like this before, but not a 10. The 10 is a bigger car. It's a little bit more bloated. It uses a 4B11 engine instead of the 4G63, which was in every other Evo. So it feels different. It sounds different and feels different. So I'm like, cool. Haven't really done a super high horsepower one of these. Let's see how it goes. So I get in the car, strap in, and the tuner decides to ride with me instead of the owner because the owner just wanted to see his car go, which is actually pretty popular when I do car reviews. A lot of times the owners have never seen their car be driven. They want to see it roll from the outside. So that's understandable. It's fine. And I'm with a friend named L Freeman who hooked me up with the review. And L is an ex airborne veteran who literally showed up to the shoot wearing a shirt that said, I kill terrorists. <laughs> and <laughs> so these are the type of people you're around sometimes. And L, if you're watching, you're awesome. He had the 700 horsepower GTO and I reviewed that too. So naturally we have this crazy high profile car, crazy high profile owners, and we're driving around. And finally, I do the first pull. The pull hits so hard that you can see in the video in the back seat, I have my camera backpack and it's literally getting thrown around. So the whole thing is moving and being tossed around and I'm like, this car's really fast. Like it had been a while since I'd driven something that fast and I was really appreciating that. Everything goes so perfect, unlike any other day. The car doesn't break. Everything's great. There was no you know, misfires or anything along those lines with a car being powered in E85, that can happen. So driving around, I say my outro, thanks for watching, blah, 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 you know, have a great day. And then I turn the camera off and I put the lens cap back on. I'm like, whew, I made it, I survived, that's awesome. But then the tuner goes, you're not gonna launch it? And I'm like, uh, doesn't this have a stock differential in the back? And he goes, yeah, they don't really make an aftermarket diff for this yet. You know, it was fairly new at the time. And I was like, oh no, oh no, I don't think it's a good idea. Let's not do it. And he goes, oh, come on, man, I tuned it. Let me, let me feel what it feels like. And I'm like, if the car breaks, it's on you. Shake on it. So 
basically shook on it. I can't remember if we did it literally, but it was a mutual verbal agreement. <laughs> and I find a spot. It's perfect straightaway. We're in like Gloucester, you know, middle of nowhere, Virginia. Do the pull, bump, 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 crazy two-step, slip the clutch. It's this twin disc quartermaster hard clutch. So it's very hard to get a smooth launch off of it. I did it fine. It wasn't perfect, but I got it going. It, you know, got the little bog, the bump, 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 and then it went. And we just do a pull. Awesome, got it on video. Just turn it off again. Tuner goes, not good enough. I'm like, oh, come on, man. Let no, no, please. Outside, I'm playing it cool. Like, you know, I don't know. Inside, I'm going, please don't make me do this. And he's like, come on, just one more time for me. And I'm like, oh, you pulled that card. How dare you? And I do it one more time. Bump, 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 bump. Does, I nail it. Like, I really do it this time. <laughs> Awesome. Got it on video. Lens kept back on. Drive back to the house. Do not do anything else. No more pulls. No more anything. As fun as it is. Cruising back. We're back into town and naturally these cars are hard to drive around town. You know with the heavy clutch and everything going. You have to rev to about four to five thousand rpm to get it to move. So you're like you know it's it's really obnoxious. Cruising down the road and there's this girl in a Camaro next to me, like a brand spanking new Camaro. I was single at the time. And I look over and she's pretty cute. And I'm like, oh, look at her. And the tutor's like, yeah, she is pretty cute. And she looks over and smiles and I start waving. I wave at her like dorkly like this. And all of a sudden, as I'm waving, it goes, and the rear diff just completely shatters. And there's a giant trail of oil going down the road. And I look at the rear view mirror, there's smoke and everything. And somewhere in the depths of my hard drive, I think is the clip of this happening. And I pull over into a Shell gas station and Reese gets out of the car and he just shrugs. He just goes, it's an Evo. That's what he says. I'm like, I'm so sorry. Like, I feel so bad. And he goes, I saw you launch it. I was like, I didn't want to be that guy. I was like, he told me so. But I was like, yeah, you know, uh, he wanted it in the video due to his tuning work and everything. And he goes, can you just not post it online? I'm like, okay, I won't post it online. And I never did. I kept my word. Um, but this was like three years ago, so it's okay now. And got a trailer, got everything on board. Elle's just like, man, that sucks. Car goes away. And this was like the fourth time the car had broke and cost him so much money. But he changed out the diff within two days and he was back on the road again, just like that. So it all worked out. Never put up the clip, even though it's such a glorious clip, um, especially because you can see my last wave, you know, and that was that. After that, I was like, here, let's cheer you up. Let's film something else. You know, we get in the car and we just film kind of a video podcast in the car talking about the car culture in Virginia Beach and everything. And everybody was in a much better mood after that. He kind of forgot that his Evo broke earlier and everything was great. And it just shows that even when cars break, there's always kind of the light at the end of the tunnel. And that's why filming car stuff never gets old because you really just don't know what's going to happen. This is a bad idea, but it's gonna be fun. I had a friend, his name's Marcus, and he is this notorious street racer in Maryland. And he had this Mitsubishi Evo that was extraordinarily fast. He was beating everybody on the street but he was also the biggest troll in the world on the internet. He would tell everybody, he still does this to this day, sorry Marcus, he still does this to this day and says his Evo only has 300 horsepower. So he does this and he has the nickname Kenny G because he listens to jazz music as he's doing it. <laughs> and I meet him virtually online. He messaged me on Facebook and this is when my channel was much smaller, it was in 2014. And I had to travel pretty far to get any content. So he messaged me going, hey, I have this Evo for you. You should definitely try it. 
okay, that sounds amazing. He sends me videos of him just killing it. The guy shifts so fast, he might as well be a paddle shift. And it's incredible how fast he drives. So I'm like, I can't wait to go meet this guy. He's such a mystery. And so I bring my friend Zach along and he has this blue Honda hatch that's turbo and everything. We go up to Maryland and I review his car. Get in the car. He gives me a ride in it to let me get used to it. And he slams into fourth gear and all the teeth shred off the gear. So then he goes, well, that's peculiar. He's just calm, collected, whatever. And he goes, you can still drive if you want. I'm like, okay. So pull over, get in the car, set up my camera. It's really cold outside. I'm like, uh, get in the car and do a few pulls on the highway. And we get our video done. Everything's great. And he goes, you know what? That was a lot of fun. How about you come up back to Maryland someday? I'm like, three hour drive, no big deal. Fast forward about five months later, my friend Zach, who had this Honda hatch, EG, it's like an early 90s Honda, giant turbo, fully built. And on the dyno, it spat flames out of the hood, whole nine yards, 525 wheel horsepower with like, you know, 2000 pounds. Car's super fast. And Marcus is like, I've seen your car online. You should come up to Maryland and see if you can prove yourself. So I'm like, this is a bad idea, but it's gonna be fun. So we all convoy up out of self-restraint. I don't drive my car just to stay out of trouble. I carpool with somebody else and we have Zach. We drive all the way there and it's freezing cold. Cops kick us out of a parking lot and finally go to another parking lot and this guy in a Camaro comes up. It's like Lincoln Felter, supercharged, 600 something horsepower. So they just are like, hey, let's see what happens. And the guy in the Camaro is skeptical. He's like, I think I'm just gonna lose. I don't think this is worth the time. They go out there anyway, and I'm watching it from the back and the Camaro goes, Zach then goes, you know, lag, 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 boom. He just slingshots by the Camaro, no problem. And he also, forgot to upgrade his brakes. So drum brakes, sparks are flying as he's just slowing down. Finally, he's good, cruising back, gives a thumbs up to the Camaro, everything's fine. Well, we turn around and we're starting to go back towards Virginia and Zach's car breaks. <laughs> so then we pull over on the side of the road, it's pitch black, it's cold. We're like being on the side of the road with a turbocharged Honda, on a highway when there's reported street racing earlier. This is not a very good scenario. So then the car magically somehow we get it fixed. I mean, as bare bones as possible and we're limping it. But then we forget the car is powered on E85 and there's no E85 to be found anywhere. And with his tank like on the E, we finally find a station at the border of like Maryland and Virginia. So. It was quite the adventure. That car was a huge part of my channel for a while, and then it eventually blew up, just like every crazy turbo Honda does. Marcus ended up being in a viral video where he was at Ocean City Cruising Week, and he's, he has a new Evo this time. He sold the Kenny G, and then he got a Corvette for a while, and he was like, oh, no, I don't really, you know, whatever. Went back to Evo, because it's his passion, and he's sitting at a stoplight, and his friend is behind him. And then Marcus is at the line and he starts two-stepping, like about to launch the car. And the line is, Marcus, don't do it. So the guy's going, no, don't do it. There's a cop right here. And he did it, got pulled over. And so he's definitely made a mark on the internet. And I hope he's watching this because he's been an awesome friend ever since. And Zach as well. He actually ended up selling the Honda hatch to another friend of mine without me knowing. And I actually would have bought that Honda hatch had I had I known, and I would have definitely gone the extra distance and fixed it back up again. Because that thing would just go so fast while also spinning. His license plate said winning spinning. So he would just always just roast the tires all the way down the street, leaving these giant black marks. Impractical? Yes. Stupid? Yes. Unreliable? Yes. Fun? Yes. Such a bad idea. I never advise this, I never condone this, but. Mm. I was on Rally North America, which is like the most grassroots rally ever. It's like 400 bucks to enter, every dollar goes to charity. 
and you just have a good time. It's like, think like NASCAR and rally put together. And we're traveling through Missouri and I'm in my 2013 Mustang GT. It's been my mascot of the channel. I have stickers all over it. I have numbers all over it. And we're cruising we're in Missouri and I'm next to an Audi R8 and we're at a light. And I had just beaten this Audi R8 at the drag strip. So he was not happy and he leaves and he does a launch and my friend Brandon starts instigating me going, oh, come on, just like, just fly by him. Just be that guy, turn your hazards on, go by him. I'm like, okay. So the, the terrain there was kind of up and down like this, like a roller coaster. So you couldn't see over these peaks. And he went over the peak and I downshift. I do all of third gear and all of fourth gear, which is like 130 miles an hour past him. So I go over the crest and then past the Audi R8 and at the bottom coming this way is a Dodge Charger cop. And I fly right by him and he hits the brakes so hard that there's smoke coming off the front tires. <laughs> and um, I look at Brandon, I look at my speedometer, I look at Brandon again and Brandon goes, I mean, <laughs> I'm like, okay. So I go into fifth gear and I'm just rolling, go up the hill. And this is like such a bad idea. I never advise this, I never condone this, but mm, go up the hill and there's a fork in the road. We are hoping there's gonna be more road just to kind of open up, but there's this fork out of nowhere. And we have two choices. We got a business district or more highway. And Brandon's like, business district, business district. So we go left at, we're cooking probably 120 in a live axle Mustang, which is not smart. So you go into there um, and there's only one business and a, tr a tractor repair place. And we pull in, it's a gravel. There's an 18 wheeler on jack stands, no wheels or anything. We pull in behind it, pop the hood, act like we're broken down. I change my shirt, I change my hat, I pull the stickers off the car. I'm freaking out, my adrenaline's running. And then uh, the guy who owns the place comes out. He goes, how can I help you find gentlemen? I'm like, oh yeah, we're lost. We might be break down. Cars kind of, you know, messing up. We milk like 45 minutes out of this really nice guy. And, um, and then after that, our last stop was a winery. That's how we were finishing out the day. So we pull up the GPS and go, okay, the only way to get to this winery is to go on the highway we just ran on for 19 miles. Okay, so we get on the highway. We're in this bright blue loud Mustang cruising. We're rehearsing the entire time. What are we going to say? What are we going to say? Um, oh, there's another grabber blue Mustang on the rally. It was him. It wasn't us. That's a, we'll just say that. And since the numbers were off the car, we couldn't have been the same people, obviously. So <laughs> we keep driving. We finally pull into the winery. We turn left pull into this gravel parking lot, get out, close that door. You get that thunk and you're like, we made it. And then we look over and three charger cops with the lights on fly by the winery and we sprint inside, sit down and we're at, uh, you know, the lady comes in, you know, all proper with her tie and everything. She's like, can I, can I get something for you, sir? I'm like, I will take anything right now. And uh, Scott Spielman, the guy who ran Rally North America comes up, grabs my shoulder and he's like, how was your day, David? And if you get a ticket in this rally, you get disqualified. So I was like, everything was great. We were Boy Scouts. We drove the speed limit the entire time. Nothing happened. I know it's stupid, but I'm gonna do it anyway. So the Supra, is kind of a unicorn for many people, but some people kind of see it as just an old Japanese sports car and the values just somehow stayed high. So I never ended up saving up to get one, even though when I was younger, I was like, I'm gonna have a Mark IV Supra, blah, 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 but it just didn't work out. So I ended up going down to Orlando, Florida for Adam LZ's open house. And it's a pretty cool little car meet. There's really cool cars. There's even like an R34 there and a whole bunch of interesting stuff. So I said that I was gonna leave the house at 8.30. He was not awake at 8.30. I said, you know what? I'm gonna stick to my guns and I'm gonna keep going. So me and Alejandra get in the car. We start driving north back to Atlanta. 
just driving along, driving along, get probably halfway through Georgia. And all of a sudden, I look in my rear view mirror and I see this little tiny red speck. It gets closer and closer and closer and closer. It starts gaining and gaining and gaining. And I'm like, okay, they're going pretty fast. They're starting to go faster and faster and faster. You know what? I'll just move over. You know, I'll just let them go by. I'm not trying to get a ticket today. I'm just chilling, I'm cruising home. Look in the rear view. Oh, it's a Supra. You know, it's this beautiful red Supra with drag radials on it. Like giant tires on the back, super intimidating looking. And it gets right on my bumper, gets on a little bit, lets the blow off valve purge, all that. I'm like, oh my God, this thing's wild. He pulls up next to me. I'm like, he's going to try and mess with me. I know. I just know this is going to happen. He rolls down his window and goes, I watch you. I watch you on YouTube. I'm like, oh, really? No way. So we ended up just kind of cruising and goofing off, you know, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You know, I didn't want to say bye to this guy because he seemed so chill. And it's fun when you run into somebody on a road trip that you've never met before, but they enjoy cars as much as you do. So it kind of makes the drive more enjoyable. You know, you're kind of cruising with another sports car who has the same mindset. You're like, oh, I don't want to have a boring drive all the way back to Atlanta. So, you know what, maybe I'll see if he needs gas. He definitely needed gas. So I rolled down my window, I said, hey, I gotta get gas, do you? And he goes, oh yeah, I have to too. So we pull over to this Chevron station, get gas, gets out, he's like, Bro, I've been watching you since so and so. I'm from Qatar in the Middle East. I'm like, you're from Qatar? What are you doing here? And he goes, oh, I go to school in Florida. To go home for Christmas break, there's a direct flight out of Atlanta and it was way cheaper. So we're just kind of getting to know each other a little bit, talking while we're pumping our gas. He goes, so listen, you're going to think I'm crazy, but, and I'm kind of looking at Alejandra and I'm like, what's he going to say? And he goes, do you want to have a super for a month, basically? I was like, I'm sorry, what? And he goes, no, seriously, I don't want to leave my super at the airport for, you know, weeks on end. And I understood that. And he goes, it'll be a lot safer with you. You respect cars, you like cars, and you get videos out of it. And I'm going to love when you make videos out of it. So it's a win-win for everybody. Take it. I'm like, there's something fishy about this. But he showed his title, he showed his registration, showed the car, effect, like all of it. I was like, oh man, I don't if I do this, I'm going to have to video you saying that it's all okay. And also that if anything breaks on it, it's not my fault. And he goes, okay. I'm like, no way. So his name was Isa, super cool guy. Put up my phone. I go, okay, go ahead. And he goes, I Isa, you know, so-and-so if David breaks it, it's not his responsibility. I want him to enjoy the car and I, he better beat on it. Like he literally told me I'm going to be upset if you don't beat the crap out of it. I'm like, this is not happening. You know, it's an 800 wheel horsepower Supra and he's just giving me the keys. I was like, this is so bizarre. We come up with this plan of dropping off the Supra at the Atlanta airport at first. We pull into the international parking deck, pull in, I park next to him, I give him a hug for everything, even, even suggesting the idea. And he grabs his bag and he walks away and goes, all right, see you later. And he just throws me the super key. And I'm like, this is not real. This is no, this can't be. So my girlfriend knows how to drive stick, but not perfectly well. So I was like, you know, 800 horsepower Supra and a 600 wheel horsepower Mustang with a heavy clutch. Let's just wait. So we drive all the way back to my house and drop off the Mustang. The next morning I grab my buddy Kyle to help me go grab the Supra. So we go up to the upper deck where I parked it. I tried to park it in kind of a hidden spot of the garage, kind of behind a wall. And we go up to it and I'm holding the key and I'm about to unlock it. I'm like, this feels dirty. This feels bad. Like the owner's not here. This isn't my car. And I'm about to just drive away with it and take it home. This is weird. So I lock the car, I get in. It has carbon fiber door panels inside, like door cards. He has like the president of Qatar decaled on the back. I'm like, this totally relates to me, you know, and getting in. We put in the parking ticket and it's 36 bucks for one night at the international terminal. I'll never forget it because I look at Kyle and I said, Kyle, I just got a Toyota Supra with 800 horsepower for $36. I don't care if it's for a limited amount of time. It's $36. He goes, dude, this is stupid. I'm like, I know it's stupid, but I'm gonna do it anyway. 
and I start driving it back. And I'm just cruising, and of course we get stuck in Atlanta traffic. That's not fun, and I'm almost out of gas because it was powered on E85. It had a flex fuel sensor in it, so if I absolutely had to put pump gas in it, I could. But he said, please, please, please use E85. I go, sure, I will use E85 for you. So I'm limping it back. You know, I'm like clutching everywhere I need to, or like to try and save gas at every moment to try not to starve this very expensive built 2JZ. And meanwhile, Issa's like, oh yeah, I've been through five 2JZs. It doesn't matter to me. And I'm like, how do you not care? So get to an E85 station, fill it up, get all the way back to my house. And then every single day after that, it rained and I got a 102 degree fever. So the car kind of sat there. I would warm it up, you know, every day just to turn it on, get it going. So the E85 and all that wouldn't be so wonky, but I felt like I needed to keep this a secret. So everybody who was coming over saying hello or whatever, they're like, why do you have a Supra in your driveway? And I would always joke going, I bought it for $36. You know, I, as a joke, I was never serious about it. I just can't believe this happening, but Issa's gonna be home in like five days. And I still hadn't made content with the car because I was just so sick and it kept raining and you don't drive drag slicks in the rain. It's just not what you do bad move so finally stops raining but it's still like 20 degrees outside so i can't get traction at all and then i think you know what that might make it more entertaining so i thought about what isa said he said beat the snot out of it if you don't i'll be upset I go, okay so i do the car review of it and it never gets traction so one of my friends named Javier down in Florida had a Supra. It was the black one that had like a thousand wheel horsepower built by Real Street down in Florida. And the way he always got traction in his was he would do this massive rolling burnout just to heat up the tires. It wouldn't be that smoky or dramatic, but it would just get heat in the tires. I'm like, I saw him do that. I can do that. So I go out on the street and I'm like, let me think how you did it. Oh, okay. So I just go doo, 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 you know, all the way down the street. And then I was like, well, that was really cool. So I made sure to film that. And then I did my first pull in the car and I couldn't believe how fast that car was. It was pretty wild, but I ended up spinning up until about 130 miles an hour. So I'm just, you know, it's all turbo noise, you know, it's just, and you're like, oh yeah, this is still a 30 year old car. You know, like it still got the creaks and rattles and all that. So that kind of adds more excitement to it. Cause it's shaking. You're like, oh my God, this is so wild. Then I end up doing a silly video with it where I go grocery shopping in it. Yeah, I go grocery shopping in an 800 horsepower Supra. Is it even possible? And I'm like, oh wow, the trunk's actually pretty big. That's nifty. And so I did that. And then I made a video comparing my 2JZ240 to an actual Supra, which was interesting because the power to weight made it really close. The 500 wheel horsepower 240 was extremely close to speed wise to the Supra. So handling all that made a comparison video lastly i made the video giving the supra back and i remember after that happening i had about three other offers of people saying you can keep my car for a week or you can do this it just didn't work out but i just thought how interesting it was of people's generosity you know like people's cars are their babies and somebody will be like yeah i've owned this car 10 years but sure you can have it for a while and Issa treated that Supra like his baby, and but he just didn't care because he trusted me. So I give the Supra back to Issa. He gets in the car, big old cheesy grin on his face, happy to have his car back. And he goes, you didn't get on it enough. I'm like, are you kidding me? And he goes, you didn't bang off rev limiter or anything. I'm like, well, yeah, because I wanted to save the motor. He goes, it's fine. And, he just, and all the way down downtown Atlanta goes, like fire spitting out of it, two step. He's like, I'm glad to have my car back. And then went all the way back to Florida right afterwards. So probably one of the strangest, but most fulfilling experiences I've ever had in my life. And I got to drive one of my dream cars for an entire month. <laughs>